There was something almost gypsyish about her appearance. She had this olive complexion, cloud of beautiful black hair, and she had a voluptuous figure. She fantasized that she had been brought up as a sacred dancer, taught sacred Hindu rituals on the banks of the Ganges. This exotic dancer, Mata Hari, she's a beautiful young girl, attractive, willing to do things other women don't want to talk about. She had this reputation as being the greatest spy of the 20th century, a woman who was responsible for the deaths of 50,000 men. In her short life, Mata Hari played many roles. Most people were fooled, none more than herself. But there were always doubters. At the height of her fame as an exotic dancer in Paris, a member of the audience was heard to exclaim, she, an oriental, don't be silly. Hamburg or Rotterdam or possibly Berlin. The critic was right. Mata Hari's early days were as ordinary as her later life was exotic. Only once did she confess the truth in the interrogation that would lead ultimately to her execution as a spy. I was born Margareta Gertrude Zeller on the 7th of August, 1876, in the Dutch town of Leerwarden. I was the eldest child of four, the first and only daughter of hatmaker Adam Zeller. She was a really sort of adored child. I mean, her, her friends in Leerwarden remember at the time that she went to school, she went to a rather exclusive girls' school. And she wore a red dress. I mean, no girl at that time would wear a red dress. From the start, it was clear that Margareta knew she was different from the rest. Schoolgirls were collecting each other's autographs. Mata Hari describes herself as an orchid among buttercups. But at the same time, there was tremendous tragedy that she had to face very early on. Her father, despite the fact that he'd made a lot of money um, speculating on oil shares, went bankrupt. Um, he left Matahari's mother for another woman and went off to Amsterdam. Um, the family was broken up because Matahari's mother then died. So suddenly, in her mid-teens, she's lost everything. Soon after her mother's death, Margareta was sent away to become a kindergarten teacher. But in the first of many scandals, she was forced to leave after a sexual liaison with the headmaster. That may have been the beginning of Marguerite's realization that she was very attractive to men and that if she'd lost everything else, she still had this tremendous sexual power and that was gonna be the key to her survival. 18 years old, alone and with a damaged reputation, Margareta's prospects were grim until she met Rudolf MacLeod, a Dutch army captain on leave from the Far East. 20 years her senior, MacLeod was a tough professional soldier. He had devoted his life to the army, but now he was looking for a wife. When my father met Harry, I met her, I have only heard about the stories, of course. My father met Mata Hari through a lonely heart ad that he put in the paper. Or his friends put it in because he was on leave in Amsterdam. And they thought that it was time he got married. And they turned it into a joke. And they put an ad in the paper. Captain in the East Indies Army, currently on leave, seeks to return to the East Indies as a married man. He's seeking a cultured young lady of pleasing appearance and gentle character. And she immediately responded, enclosing a picture, so that he would be instantly interested in such a beautiful woman. <laughs> 
at Al it was love at first sight. Because if you read their letters, you feel weak at the knees. They were so crazy about one another. Darling, what a lovely letter you wrote to me. I wish I could be with you. You ask if I feel like having fun rather ten times than just once. Go right ahead. I'm going to be your wife in a few weeks' time anyway. It's such fun that we both have the same fiery temperament. They were married in 1895. They would have two children, a son, Norman, and a daughter nicknamed Non. Norman was just a baby and Non not yet born when, in 1897, Captain McLeod and his new family left for the Dutch East Indies. Margareta's behavior on board ship wasn't a good sign for the marriage. Even on board ship, I've been told that she flirted with every available officer, which my father absolutely hated, because in those days, a wife was her husband's property and was supposed to behave as her husband wished, and this was clearly not appropriate behavior. In May 1897, they arrived in Java and settled in the small town of Tunpun. It seemed a world away from Leovaden, but appearances were deceptive. Dutch society there was every bit as conventional and restricted as it was back in Holland. The same rules applied, you know, you, who you could talk to, how you should behave, how you should walk down the street, what you ate, what you wore. Um, who could speak to who. There was the same sort of pecking order, the same hierarchy. Bored with domestic responsibilities, Margareta would often leave her children with the servants and wander the island in search of amusement. It was on one of these trips that she first saw the style of dancing that she would later claim as her own. A few months later, McLeod was promoted to garrison commander and posted to the island of Sumatra. His letters home were full of anxious advice for his somewhat irresponsible wife. But even McLeod's worst fears could not have prepared him for what was to come once his wife and children joined him in Sumatra. The Malaysian nanny attempted to poison them. Both children became seriously ill, and three-year-old Norman, his father's favorite, died. Norman died on the 27th of June, 1899. The nanny who was in charge of the children, the Ama, was actually carrying out a vendetta against the family by a soldier who was her lover, who had been imprisoned by Rudolf MacLeod on some sort of charge or crime that he had committed. So he had asked the Ama to poison the family. Norman died. And Rudolf was absolutely devastated by his death. He had written to someone to say that it was the worst thing that had ever happened to him in his life. Her husband started drinking very heavily. He was quite authoritarian anyway, and when he was almost permanently drunk, I think he would beat her up and be thoroughly unpleasant to her. I think he'd rather the novelty of their marriage had worn off. After seven years of marriage, the McLeods returned to Holland and separated. Margareta set up home in The Hague with Non, but Rudolf was determined to get his daughter away from the woman he now despised. Rudolf actually had two private detectives following her, and they both seemed to suggest that she was having gentlemen callers coming and seeing her, which would have been scandalous enough in and of itself. But it's shortly after that that Rudolf stopped sending her money and the suggestion becomes that she's actually working as a prostitute. And it's very interesting because the second detective is a woman and she seems to be saying she's not a bad woman, but 
If you take the child away from her, she will be lost. By 1904, McLeod finally succeeded in getting his daughter back. He took her for a day out. They never returned. For Margareta, the loss of her daughter severed the final link she had to ordinary domestic life. And so I came to Paris with half a franc in my pocket and went straight to the Grand Hotel. People have asked me why Paris. I thought that all women who ran away from their husbands went to Paris. You're watching Matahari, your own biography. It's dance in the library of the Museum of Oriental Art, in front of an audience of writers, artists and intellectuals. Monsieur Guimet, the museum's owner, suggested I dance under the name of Matahari, which means Eye of the Day in Malay. With a new name, a new wardrobe, and an invention all her own, the career of Matahari had begun. Without any formal training or knowledge of dance, this Dutch divorcee managed to beguile her sophisticated Parisian audience with a performance which was like nothing they had ever seen before. It appealed to their sense of mystery and also to their idea of alien sensualities, to eroticism, to things that were certainly not part of monogamous Christian Western Europe. Whatever its precise ingredients, Matahari's dance was an overnight sensation. All Paris is talking of the beautiful woman known as Matahari. Matahari, the Indian dancer, voluptuous and tragic. She was in all of the major newspapers. In a single year, she danced at 30 different public venues. She danced at La Scala. She danced at the Opera in Paris. She made her debut in Austria. She went to Germany. I mean, she really was the star of dance. In fact, Matahari's dances were at best crude imitations of what she had seen in Java and no more authentic than her own imagination. But if anyone realized this, they didn't seem to care. Everyone wanted to know her. Other musicians, composers, and choreographers became very interested in her. Massinet called her charming artiste. Giacomo Puccini was very interested in her and included her in an opera. And she even had a sort of audience with Diaghilev. For all the talk of art and beauty, the secret of Matahari's appeal was basic. Matahari is entirely naked, with only some jewels and a piece of cloth around her hips and legs. She is charming, with a rather big mouth and a pair of breasts which make many a spectator sigh with envy. In the Et les commentaires de presse que l'on a. In the literature and press comments, it was claimed that you could see her pubic area. But when you look closely at photographs of her performances, you can see that she wore a flesh colored body stocking. She gave the illusion of dancing naked. And that was really new, because it was the first time there had been the suggestion of nudity on stage. She did seem to be reluctant to undress completely in public. There was a story going around which she may well have put around herself, that the reason she kept her um, in gold embossed embroidered breastplate on was that her husband had bitten off one of her nipples in a jealous rage. Um, but that may just have been, um, you know, to add to the romance and the excitement. <laughs> Matahari's dancing also served as an effective advertisement for other, more intimate services. Matahari's dances were a pretext for Matahari to show that she could dance, while at the same time, let's be blunt and vulgar, she would find clients. She would find men who, having seen her almost naked, would want her and then offer her a fortune. 
and she did know some extremely powerful and wealthy men. I mean, um, Puccini was one of her lovers. Um, she was also lovers with the French Minister of War at one point. Almost every night I went dancing in the most exclusive salons in Paris, earning a wage of a thousand francs a night. I was also a courtesan. I visited and received the men I danced for. Matahari was a courtesan who gained her income from men. In other words, she slept with men for money. She wasn't content with little gifts. It was money. It was jewelry. It was dresses. It was furs. And in the newspapers of the time, the courtesans were followed by the journalists. And it was essentially the equivalent of the advertisements on the television. In other words, it would be reported that a prince had given Matahari a set of emeralds, a count had given Matahari a horse. <laughs> well, there you have it. Matahari knew how to manipulate the press. She never told the same story twice, inventing her past as easily as she invented her dances. I think she was very vain of herself and wanted to produce herself as much as she could. In fact, she produced herself too much. She was a dark beauty with a very beautiful figure. But to my remembrance, she lacked charm. Her career lasted for 10 years. At the height of her fame, she traveled from city to city, lover to lover, enjoying the public and private adoration that came with success. But events were on the horizon that would bring this all to an abrupt end. Her success inevitably uh, only lasted as long as her youth and her beauty. Um, and by the outbreak of the First World War, she was nearly 40. It was increasingly difficult for her to get commissions to dance. And she was invited to perform in a production in Berlin, which was due to open in September of 1914. So she was thrilled by this. She went off to Berlin, I think, in about July and was in rehearsal for this production when war broke out, so it never happened. On the 17th of August, I left for Holland. Setting foot on the soil of my native country, I admit I experienced terrible shame. I found myself without any money at all. I did have an old lover in The Hague, Colonel Baron Edouard van der Capellen, of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars, a very rich married man. He set me up in a house in The Hague. There is this oil painting we have of my great uncle Eduard, and he is standing in a beautiful uniform of major with all his medals on. But I think he looks quite handsome, and I suppose that Mother Heidi would have thought him very handsome too in his uniform. Mother Hari was now right back where she'd started. She tried to reestablish contact with her now 17 year old daughter, Non. I spent an unhappy time in The Hague. I had not seen my daughter for 12 years, but the plan came to nothing because she refused to see me. I have been told that Non did walk past her house, past Matahari's house on a few occasions in The Hague, but didn't want to go in. And, well, Maybe she was a bit ashamed, because in those days, having a mother who danced naked wasn't something that one would be proud of. And most certainly not because everyone was talking about it. So it must have been awful for her. Now entering middle age, bored and isolated and dependent on her elderly lover for money, Matahari longed to return to Paris, the scene of her greatest triumphs. She planned a brief visit, ostensibly to collect some belongings. It was this innocuous decision that would launch her into the most dangerous chapter of her life. The Germans were looking to recruit well-connected people as spies. That is why they were interested in Mata Hari. 
Et c'était précisément le cas de Matahari. And it is known for certain that Matahari was hired by the Germans in the autumn of 1915. À l'automne de 1915. Madame Matahari's car, please. Before she left for Paris, Matahari was approached by a German agent in Holland. He gave her money and a code name, H21. In return, she agreed to bring back intelligence. In the event, all she brought back was her luggage. When she asked for more money to return to Paris, the Germans insisted that she first go to a spy school. Donc, il so fallait... she needed some training, and we are certain that she went to Germany, where she received eight days of training from high-ranking German intelligence service officers. The newly qualified spy went straight back to Paris. When Matahari came back to Paris during the war, it wasn't the city that she'd left in 1914. There was an incredible sense of paranoia in the city. Hundreds of people came under suspicion of espionage. I mean, someone actually wrote about a kind of spy psychosis at the time. The other thing that had changed so dramatically that was going to affect her life was the fact that there was no place for a kind of courtesan. There was no place for um, a woman who had done what she'd done before the war. Morals had changed. Matari was seen to be a kind of symbol of pre-war decadence. Paris may have changed. Matahari had not. In Paris, in the salon of Madame Donneville, I met Captain Vadim de Maslov of the 1st Special Imperial Russian Regiment. He became my lover, and it was a great love on both sides. He was 20 years her junior, but I don't think that made her love any less real. It was um, a time of extraordinary uh, relationships. Uh, to fall in love with, to marry someone who was completely out of your social station or completely um, years younger or older than you, it was, it was not uncommon at all in those extraordinary times during the war when you never knew whether you were going to be alive the next day. Your portrait is always with me, even on the days of battle. I cover your wonderful body with mad kisses. It was August 1916. On the Somme, thousands were dying daily. Mata Hari decided she would like to visit the spa town of Vittel to take the waters as she had done before the war, another casual decision that would have fatal consequences. Vittel was close to a military zone, and visitors required a special permit from the war office. When Mata Hari went to collect hers, she found herself ushered into the offices of Captain Ledoux, head of the Deuxième Bureau, the French Secret Service. Ledoux had long suspected that Matahari was working for the Germans and decided that the best way to entrap her was to hire her as an agent for France, a favorite device of his. Hesitant at first, I finally went to see Captain Ledoux. I told him, Captain, I agree in principle. In my mind, I had it all worked out. I wanted enough money so as not to be unfaithful to Vadim Domoslov. I wanted to marry my lover and be the happiest woman in the world. When she first went to see Captain Ledoux, a real idiot who happened to be employed by French military intelligence at the time, and he was such an idiot that he himself, a couple of years later, was accused of being a German spy himself, what'd she tell him? She said that for around about a million francs, um, she would resume an affair which she almost certainly had never had with the Crown Prince of Germany, extract from him all his secrets and bring them back to France. Now that, to me, doesn't look like a real spy. It looks like a woman doing what she had done for the last quarter of a century, and that is acting out her fantasies.
Captain Ledoux told Matahari to return to Holland and await instructions. While traveling via Spain because of the war, she was stopped en route at Falmouth, where she came under the scrutiny of yet another intelligence service. With my wife, whose job was to search for female passengers, I boarded the ship and challenged Matty Harry as to a real identity. My wife often remarked that for a tall woman, she had the neatest feet she had ever seen in anyone. And from my experience, I considered her one of the most charming specimens of female humanity that ever I gazed upon. The French sent her back to Madrid. By now, Matahari had thrown herself so wholeheartedly into the role of double agent that she was determined to show her French masters that she could deliver. She thought she could pull off something impressive in Madrid by going to spy on the head of German intelligence in Spain, the military attaché Kalle. She had to explain her business to him, so she told him she had pretended to accept Captain Ladoux's proposals, but that in fact she was still working for Germany. I was as charming as could be. I played with my feet and did everything a woman does when she wants to win a man. And I realized that Carla was mine. At a certain moment, he said, I'm tired. I'm busy arranging a landing of German and Turkish soldiers on the coast of Morocco in the French zone. That same evening, I wrote to Captain Ladoux. I told him what I had heard. I added, I am waiting for your instructions. I can do whatever I want with my German. Having finally got her hands on some real, if trivial, intelligence, Matahari then revealed just how little she knew about the art of espionage. She sends this letter through the regular post, which was fatal on two counts. First of all, because um, there were employees within the Ritz Hotel who were working for the Germans, so would immediately get back to Calais. And secondly, of course, the post would have been read as well. Um, so that this is another indication of how incredibly naive and even stupid Matahari was in her role as an espionage agent. Encouraged by the French, she went to see Kala again to try to extract more information, but becoming suspicious, Kala decided to turn the tables on his seductress. So Kala sent a series of radio telegrams from Madrid to Berlin, in which Matahari is, of course, only referred to by her number H21. But they gave the name and address of her maid in Holland and a great deal of information which led to her immediate identification. Some people believe that these telegrams were the beginnings of a web of bluff and double bluff spun by German and French intelligence with Matahari trapped in the middle. According to the theory, rather than simply arrest her themselves, the Germans deliberately blew her cover by identifying her as Agent H-21, using a code that they knew the French had cracked. Did the German deliberately give Matahari to the French? It's likely. It's not a certainty. They may have been mad when they heard about the treason of uh, Matahari, but there is something I I'm wondering about. If they did it, it was a very nice coup. And how come that nobody after 70 years, nobody in the German who were implied in, in the process ever bragged in some book that they did it. And nobody ever did it. So I believe there is still a doubt on that. Whatever the truth, it is certain that when Matahari returned to Paris, Captain Ledoux had her under surveillance for six weeks before finally having her arrested on February 13th, 1917. When she was first arrested and taken to Saint Lazare prison, um, she was asked what she whether there was anything she wanted in her cell. 
And rather touchingly, I think, she said yes, she wanted a bath and a telephone. <laughs> She was detained there in conditions of filth and hunger uh, because there was very little food and what food there was was inedible. And she was kept in a cell where there were vermin, lice, and rats. She had been accustomed to a life of luxury. And Captain Bouchardon was hoping that these living conditions would uh, break her down and she would then confess. For the web's best bios, log on to biography.com. Captain Bouchardon was a master of interrogation with his own special methods. Over two and a half months, and on 17 separate occasions, he got Matahari to recount her life story over and over again. The least contradiction was seized on and used to incriminate her further. My grandfather interrogated her and I think he got to know her very well. He says in uh, one of his interviews after the war that he was probably one of the men who knew her the best. He considered her as uh, very dangerous because she was very intelligent. But he didn't like her. For him, she was a spy who had cost us the life of a certain number of French soldiers. And since everybody in this country had a uh, son or a cousin or a nephew uh, was killed in the war. You could not be very indulgent to spies at that time. She was literally fighting for her life. And she's writing letters every day. She's writing letters sometimes twice a day to her prosecutor saying, this isn't right. You should not be treating me this way. I am innocent. I beg you, Captain. Why drive me to desperation in a cell when I am losing my mind? You can threaten me, make me suffer, but I cannot tell you what I do not know. Please stop. Last night I coughed blood. I cried with fear and nobody could hear me show a shred of humanity. The shock has upset me so much that I no longer feel like myself. I think I am going mad. Despite the pressure, Matahari refused to admit she had ever been in the pay of the Germans. It was only when Bouchardon produced Kala's incriminating telegrams referring to Agent H-21 that she began to crack. When my grandfather showed her the telegram, she became quite mad and threw at him a glass of water. Despite this defiant act, Matahari finally began to reveal at least part of the truth. Today, I have decided to tell you the truth. If I didn't tell you the whole truth before, it was because I felt a certain shame. Around May 1916, I was at home in The Hague when there was a ring at the door. I found myself face to face with the German consul. We know you are going to France, he said. Can you collect some information for us? If you do, we'll pay you 20,000 francs. I thought of my expensive furs, which the Germans had kept at the outbreak of war, and I felt it would be quite fair to get what I could from them. But I can assure you, I never wrote them one single word from Paris. Matahari continued to insist that though she had taken money, she had never spied for the Germans. But this did not satisfy her interrogators. She was sent to trial on July 24, 1917, accused of spying against France, the only country in reality that she had ever actually spied for. In such a courtroom, Margarita Gertrude Zeller MacLeod, named Matahari, would have sat in the place where I am standing right now. Just uh, under Matahari's seat was standing uh, her lawyer named Clunet. Clunet was a very famous uh, lawyer in the Paris bar. He was aged more than 70 years and uh, was considered as one of the best specialists in international law. He had no experience in criminal law. Anyway, he tried to do anything he could for defending his client. During the trial, 
prosecutor, Mornay, asked the president of the Council of War to have a secret hearing. Not the public, neither pressed, were welcome. So all the audience was in absolute secrecy. The one man who might have been expected to support Matahari made matters worse. Maslov was actually interviewed by the interrogators, although he didn't appear in court, and he did repudiate Matahari to um, the person who had come to do the interview. But we know, in fact, that, that Maslov was actually writing these slushy love letters to her at the same time, and actually explaining that even though he had repudiated her to the interrogator, he still loved her, and he had done that simply to protect himself. Though Matahari's interrogators made sure she knew of Maslov's statement, for her the real betrayal was of a more personal kind. Tragically, even though Vadim de Maslov was writing Matahari these letters reaffirming his love, she never received them. She didn't even know that they existed. And so that um, in one letter, that, which has now been lost, she writes to Mornay, her prosecutor, saying, even he for whom I would have walked through fire has now betrayed me. In reality, she was condemned for fraternizing with the enemy because there was proof that she had indeed spoken to German officers and to the intelligence services. That was sufficient to make you a spy, punishable by death. Called to the stand, Matahari defended herself with a defiant declaration of her lifelong passion. I love officers. All my life I have loved them. I would rather be the mistress of a poor officer than of a rich banker. I take great pleasure in sleeping with them, regardless of money. And I like to compare the different nationalities. I swear that my relations with the officers you mention were only inspired by the feelings I have just described to you. One of the things that outraged the French military the most was the fact that she refused to be ashamed of the fact that she was a courtesan. She refused to be ashamed of that, the fact that she was divorced. And there she is in 1917 taking the stand in a French military court and saying, I love having sex with officers. And she's proud of it. And, you know, she's not going to, she's not going to burst into tears. She's not going to pretend she's something that she's not. Although blamed for the deaths of 50,000 French troops, the case against her ultimately rested on three pieces of evidence, inconsistencies in her interrogation, the incriminating telegrams, and her own admission of accepting money from the Germans. The verdict of the court was death. You're watching Matahari, your on biography. Andy. Matahari, the great self-inventor, would go to her death unaware that in espionage, unlike dance, she could not make up the rules as she went along. In the First World War, if you pretended to be a spy, you might well end up, as Matahari did, at least in France, in front of a, a firing squad. But, you know, the idea that she provided any serious military secrets, either to the French or the Germans, is, I think, pretty absurd. After Matahari was convicted, she went to cell 12, which was known as the sort of notorious cell where convicted women went. There was also some concern on the prison authorities' part that she might commit suicide, and so she had two nuns who were staying with her at the time. And there are lots of different anecdotes about what happened during that period. One was that the day before she was going to be executed, one of the nuns realized how incredibly despondent she was and actually asked her to dance. And so Matahari actually, in the cell for the condemned, actually did a version of the Dance of the Seven Veils. Matahari was preparing for her last performance. <laughs> 
At dawn on October 15, 1917, she was brought to a firing range in a forest at the Chateau Vincent on the outskirts of Paris. She refused to have a blindfold and she refused to have her hands tied to the stake. And one of her executioners would later describe her as standing so still that it made him tremble. She was very elegantly dressed, in a loose-fitting coat and pleasing hat, and above all, she showed extraordinary calm and courage. She then waved goodbye to the nuns who were kneeling by her and praying for her. She blew kisses to the soldiers, and then, again as one witness put it, she crumpled into a heap of nothing more harmful than petticoats. According to legend, only one of the 13-member firing squad aimed at Matahari, shooting her through the heart. Unease about the justice of her execution has grown ever since, and now, more than 80 years later, moves are afoot to have the verdict against her overturned. I can only say that I respect her for having had the courage to do what she did, for having found the courage to work it all out, because after all, she had to do everything herself. She was an exception to the rule, but I do think she deserved better than the fate that befell her. In Leovaden, her legend lives on. There's a story that if you pass the area of the town where Matahari's statue is... On a dark night with a full moon... You'll hear the jangle of Javanese bracelets... And the dancing of naked feet... And a ripple of girlish laughter. <laughs> Legend has it that many of Matahari's male admirers tried to save her from execution. Well, the truth is, her attorney tried a desperate ploy. He wrote a letter saying there was a rumor in the theatrical world that his client was pregnant, knowing that under French law, a pregnant woman can't be executed. But the letter was seen for what it was, just a desperate last attempt to stave off the death of one of the most notorious women in history. Monday on Biography. Critically acclaimed bands in the world. The latest is called Valari, the very best of the...